Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. My guest is Francoise Girard, the president of the International Women's Health Coalition. Francoise, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So tell me a little bit about uh, the organization. We're based in New York City, but we work with feminist groups all over the developing world, in Africa, Latin America, Asia, and the Middle East. And together with them, we advance women's access to sexual and reproductive health information and services. And by that, I mean contraception, safe abortion, HIV prevention, safe maternity care, and uh, sexuality education. All right. I'm going to try to ask you as many questions as I can in the sh short period of time we have. Okay. I'm interested in the status of adolescent and forced marriages uh, across the globe, including in the United States. What's the status of that? And, and how many women, girls and women, are subject to those conditions? So it's estimated, that we have recent estimates, that 12 million girls are married off against their will every year in the world. So, and that could be girls as, as young as 9 or 10 years old all the way up to 18. And of course, uh, this is extremely damaging to their health because once you're married, you bear children. It's damaging to their education. They're usually pulled out of school as a result. Uh, they often uh, are subject to violence in, in the relationship. That's you know, a clear finding. And uh, quite isolated from their peers and their family. They often move into the family of their husband where they have no power. So generally catastrophic for the girl and of course not good for society in general because you're completely losing the potential of these girls to contribute to society. How do we change that? It's important to start by the community, at the community level. At the coalition we work with groups who are fighting child marriage. A group we work with operates in the north of Cameroon in Central Africa in the region of Cameroon where Boko Haram has been active. You know, it's near Nigeria and Chad. So it's a very conservative environment. And yet we work with a group of survivors of child marriage, young women who either escaped the marriage just before or ran away from their husbands once they were married or who ended up as widows because quite often they're married to much older men uh, and they end up at the age of 16 with two children and their widows. And so these girls banded together a number of years ago to uh, support each other. Now it's like a mutual assistance society, but also to help other girls and prevent the practice. So they, they go from community to community and give education sessions with young girls. And they go on motorcycles, you know, with their, their cl colorful clothing, you know, going into the village. And then, you know, people gather and then they speak about the, the harms of, of uh, child marriage. And then they engage with the traditional leaders, the community leaders, and that's had a big impact. You know, often the families assume that it's the way it's always been done, and therefore you just go along with it. But once you present alternatives, a lot of the time the parents themselves think, well, she's talented. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe she should continue her education, finish secondary school, maybe learn a trade and then earn a living. So how often does this happen in the United States in terms of uh, forced marriages as opposed to adolescent? I mean, obviously we have certain age restrictions. Yeah. In the U.S. there's a number of states, and I'm less familiar with the statistics, but where uh, girls are married off at 16 and 17, uh, often under pressure. Often the girl is pregnant and the family a conservative environment puts pressure on her to get married. And uh, so whether or not she's fully in agreement is, is really a question. And some states are finally taking action. You know, we're starting to see some states basically making it illegal to get married before the age of 18, which I think should be the way forward. And how about when it comes to uh, maternal mortality rates? The United States has uh, the highest uh, rate of maternal mortality of all the developed nations. Yes. Why, why is that and what can we do about it? Uh, yes, we have really uh, appalling statistics when it comes to maternal mortality, i.e. dying in childbirth or soon after childbirth. And um, if you look at the statistics and you break them out by race, you see that the problem is particularly acute 
in black women. Black women die in childbirth at four times the rate of white women in this country. So there are issues here of access to health care, health care coverage, the kind of treatment by uh, health providers when they're there, whether or not they're treated uh, with respect. I mean, I, I think you're familiar with the story of Serena Williams almost dying after giving birth to her daughter. And she had to insist that she was not feeling well, so she was readmitted and her life was saved. But if she hadn't been Serena Williams, she might have been dismissed and be one more statistic. How about abortion rights uh, around the world? What are the developments there? And I'd be really interested in uh, what's happening in some of the largest countries, or countries certainly China, India, but also countries like Indonesia or Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, in China and in India, abortion is legal. It is, it, it's, uh, it's not restricted by law significantly. But um, in India in particular, the, the issue is actually access to the, the care, the, the safe abortion services that you should be entitled to since it's legal. And so the, the women's movement in India has really been working on the issue of stigma because a lot of women still internalize the stigma of abortion, you know, it's culturally stigmatized. And a lot of doctors also, you know, are not keen to, uh, to practice. Um, and therefore, as a result, women, especially poor women, young women, women r living in rural areas, have limited access. And then they resort to clandestine providers, which is when you are injured and killed. Um, globally, there's still uh, a lot to do to change the laws, particularly in Latin America. Latin America has the most restrictive laws uh, of all on abortion. But even in countries where the law is changed, continuing to educate doctors, to Im improve the, the, the access to care is a pressing need. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with Francoise in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info. The Rexile Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbour. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbour Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. Join me and watch the Aaron Harbor Show. 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 I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show and keep hope alive. The Aaron Harbor Show may be viewed 24 7 at no charge from any location in the world at www.harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. I am with Francoise Girard. So we were talking about abortion and you were referencing uh, Latin America and South America. What, what are the developments in Argentina? Yes, as uh, you know, there's a lot of action going on in Argentina on this front. Uh, a bill was finally passed by the lower house of parliament and the women's movement is very, very mobilized. Uh, it's been really interesting to see a conservative country like Argentina, and you, you know the Pope is Argentine, that... And, and in fact, you reference uh, Latin and South America as being conservative yeah. on these issues. And That's of course, right. a lot of that is a function of the fact that Catholicism is such a dominant religion. That's right. Catholicism and increasingly evangelical churches uh, have, have gained a foothold in Latin America. And not all of them, because they vary, but many of them are also extremely conservative on reproductive rights. So the women's movement in Argentina is overcoming all of these obstacles to actually get this bill through parliament. 
And it which, w which will grant abortion rights. That's right. In the first 14 weeks of pregnancy, abortion available without having to jump through hoops. And, and um, it would, will save lives because last year, 43 women died of unsafe abortions in Argentina. And a good number of them, uh, other women, were injured be because of clandestine. Many, many more than the, yeah, many, many more. the exactly. 43. Exactly. When it, it's, it's interesting. We, we talked about, and, well, in different countries and, and kind of the advancement of women. And, and one of the things you referenced was when women do better, when girls do better, society does better. Um, certainly when studies have been done of poverty, the consistent conclusion is that if young girls are given the opportunity to have an education, that solves myriad problems. Talk a little bit about that and, and what can we do that really would promote that, that concept? What, what, what can we do which would actually put that uh, into play at a much greater level than it is today? Yeah, the, the evidence is super, super clear on the need to educate women if we want uh, development. And in the regions, the World Bank has done a number of studies on this, in the regions where women are kept out of school or kept out of the labor market, the overall development of the society is affected pretty significantly. In a very negative manner. That's right. You know, so GDP is affected, um, uh, innovation in, in the marketplace, etc. I mean, all the contributions that women could make are, are lost, right? And um, in order to ensure that girls stay in school, we need to think about programs with the girl at the center of the intervention. Quite often people think there's going to be a magic bullet, you know, to resolve this problem. They think, oh, we're going to pay for tuition fees or we'll provide books or uniforms. These are important measures to, to help girls stay in school, but you need to do a whole lot of other things. For example, you need to pay attention to sanitation in schools because when girls begin their menstruation, they need to have access to water and a reasonably decent toilet, right? And in a lot of schools in the developing world, there is no decent sanitation. And as a result, the girls stop coming. You know, if you miss a week, a month of school, you start falling back and soon you drop out. So you need to put the girls' needs at the center and then design the interventions so most people in the United States, it would never occur to them that that bathrooms, in school bathrooms, are essential are a, a big to girls' issue. education. Uh, tell yes. me about the Trump administration. What impact is the Trump administration having on the goals of your organization? The Trump administration is systematically uh, attacking sexual and reproductive health programming and funding using the might of the U.S. government uh, and the foreign assistance that we give to poor countries, basically to try to uh, cut funding to any kind of sexual and reproductive health services. And they do this through something that we call the global gag rule, which is this set of conditions on funding uh, which prevents organizations that receive the funding in, let's say, in South Africa, from speaking about abortion. Now, if you're a clinic and you serve women and, and your service is reproductive health care, and in South Africa, abortion is legal, which it is, this is unconscionable. You know, it is, it is unethical medically, professionally. As a medical professional, you should be able to serve the full needs of your patients and the women who come to see you. So you make, you're putting these clinics in the difficult position of taking U.S. money and then giving substandard care or foregoing the money, which can be substantial, and sometimes having to close, you know, a whole wing of your hospital. And, and or, giving or substa your substandard care. You serve many fewer people, definitely. So this is, this is one of the things they've been doing. The other thing, and this, is, this affects a lot of money, this, is, this condition is attached to $9 billion of global health assistance a year that the U.S. is giving in the poorest countries. Um, the other thing that they've done is cut the funding to the United Nations Population Fund, which is the prime uh, provider of contraceptives, like the supplies, to poor countries, as well as the provider of contraceptives in emergency situations, like refugee camps.
So this is fascinating because the same administration, of course, is concerned about uh, the rapid growth of population in certain countries uh, and would like to see some of that growth uh, reduced. And, and what these policies obviously are going to have the opposite effect. Uh, they're likely to create more poverty, not less poverty, more demand for assistance, more demand for help. Uh, so if the Trump administration, if the president is reelected, uh, and the Trump administration lasts eight years. What, what do you see uh, on a global basis? What, what could that mean? Well, we'll see a lot of damage to health systems in the developing world. The, 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 those countries that are dependent on foreign assistance, you know, that are still coming out uh, of poverty, uh, it will basically disintegrate uh, services for women by, by removing access to safe abortion from the package, which means that women will go and see clandestine providers and then you know, show up in the emergency room with severe injuries. So that's one thing which is really bad. You'll also see um, uh, coalitions of organizations who are pushing their own government to invest more in healthcare and women's healthcare, we see them being separated by these policies. You know, the ones that are prepared to speak up on abortion and the ones that are not suddenly are estranged. And that is, on the whole, harmful to the effort to actually get local governments in Africa or Latin America or Asia to actually take responsibility for healthcare and invest more. You know, without civil society pressure, governments always have other things they'd rather spend the money on, like military expenditures. But with society, civil society pressure, you know, we, we can make that happen. Now, if you break apart those coalitions, then that's, that's less likely to be successful. Are any countries engaging in a strategy which says, we'll accept the money, we'll accept those conditions, and the entities, agencies, organizations getting those funds proceed on that basis, and then they create standalone services for just abortion, for example? Yeah. That's the, that question is often asked uh, because people assume it's possible to do workarounds. But in fact, you know, if you imagine a situation, let's say in Western Kenya, where we work with a network of 122 clinics that provide comprehensive care, in each of these communities, you only have one nurse. You, you don't have other health providers available to staff another clinic over there. And the way US, uh, the, the Trump administration's conditions are, are imposed, they, they would not allow you to kind of, you know, operate out of the, of the same facility with the same staff. They would want to see total separation. So, you know, there's, there's method in that madness, which is they're really trying to uh, avoid all, all provision of abortion. But the reality is abortion will always happen. It will just be dangerous. All right. On that note, we'll take our last break and we'll be right back. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info. Used by fire professionals around the world, Fire Ice XT Spray is an eco-friendly, easy-to-use suppressant gel designed to quickly and efficiently stop and contain all kinds of fire and heat related events, including fiberglass, lithium batteries, and other combustible up to 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, for use in your home, office, RV, fireplace, boat, kitchen, and garage. For more information on Fire Ice XT Spray, visit us online at fireice.com. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. Hi, I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. Because I've never done endorsements or commercials, people ask how are our programs funded, especially because we provide them as a public service to all our broadcast outlets. It's expensive to produce our show, whether we do them here in Denver or go to places such as Aspen, Washington, D.C., or even Iraq. The answer is we depend on contributions to support our work to bring you some of the nation's top opinion leaders. Individuals, businesses, foundations, and other nonprofits make tax-deductible contributions to the Democracy and Media Education Foundation to help allow us to continue to work for you. To find out more or to make a donation, just go to dmefd.org. 
The DMEF is a tax-exempt public charitable organization and has promised to dedicate 100% of every contribution to support our public affairs initiatives. If you believe, as I do, in the need for a forum which promotes civil discourse and mutually respectful discussion, I hope you'll decide to make a contribution today. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at www.harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. This is our last segment with Francoise. So I'd be really interested in how you work and how the organization is involved in the fight against HIV AIDS around the world. Our focus on HIV is adolescent girls to ensure that they have the information and the skills and uh, the support they need uh, to avoid uh, being subject to infection and also avoid another uh, a range of uh, unwanted uh, health consequences which usually result from unsafe, unprotected sex. And that's teenage pregnancy, obviously. Uh, as well as other sexually transmitted infections. And s the way we do this is, some, is through sexuality education. And in, in that regard, how, is, how do you think the treatment of women in terms of health care and reproductive rights uh, globally or in different countries is indicative of how that country not only treats women, but uh, how that country stands in terms of human rights overall? Is there a relationship there, do you think? Yeah, I found that when a country starts to, or a leader typically, you know, this is usually done by some kind of populist leader, starts to attack women's rights to gain votes with his base, um, that's usually a precursor of, you know, his general lack of regard for human rights. Because if you think about it, if you prepare to take away the right of women and girls to control their body, their sexuality, their reproduction, means you have, don't have a very good regard for women's equality and therefore for human rights more, more broadly. And I, we've seen that play out in a number of countries. They start attacking reproductive rights because it mobilizes the base. And the next thing we know, you know, they're trying to curtail freedom of the press or independence of the courts. Has the, uh, the Me Too movement uh, here in the United States and elsewhere, has that impacted uh, your work in, in any way? And, and what do you see happening in other countries? The Me Too movement comes out of the feminist movement. So we're, you know, we've been waiting for this for a long time because we've been working on issues of violence against women and harassment for a long time. And uh, so it's very helpful, I would say. I think some people are concerned about a backlash from Me Too. I'm less concerned about that because there's always a backlash of, you know, when women claim their rights. I'm more concerned about making sure that we don't just go after a few high profile perpetrators, but don't actually address the underlying conditions that allow these perpetrators to operate with impunity. So how do we reduce violence against women? Because certainly, in, uh, are there countries where violence against women is pretty much non-existent? Uh, non-existent, no, but less uh, prevalent, absolutely. So substantially less. Uh, yeah. what, what countries are at the top, two or three countries are at the top of the list where, where women have a very high probability of knowing they are not going to be uh, subjected to domestic violence or any kind of violence? One of the perhaps surprising one is Japan. Japan is a country that has low uh, rates of violence against women. And if you look at it, it's a country that also has low rates of interpersonal violence generally in society, right? And so the two are related. Uh, and it's interesting to see also the converse, which is in countries that have experienced conflict 
war, civil war, the levels of violence in society rise, and with that, the levels of violence against women. So in that regard, have you seen anything specifically in, regard, in relation to the Me Too movement in other countries uh, that has engendered some kind of immediate progress, or is that just uh, wishful thinking? Well, we're still in the early stages, but in South Africa, for example, women's rights organizations have really mobilized on Me Too to start naming individual perpetrators that so far had escaped any kind of, uh, of accountability. And they, they've done that in the development sector, they've done that in the government sector, it's also happening in the business sector. So yes, it is a global movement and women are really talking to each other and exchanging experiences on this front. All right, well maybe it's a good start. It is a start. One of the things that, one of the aspects of all this, especially in terms of sex education and sexuality, uh, women's rights, uh, and we talk about what can be taught in schools, what about the role of parents? And why, why don't we have a much greater focus on what parents need to do for their children, both boys and girls? Yeah. The key uh, approach to reducing violence uh, through sexuality education is to address harmful gender norms. Because at the root of this violence is the notion of masculinity, which requires men and boys to be aggressive, assertive, to resolve their conflicts through violent means. Uh, and that's how you're seen as a real man, right? And everyone suffers from that, including boys themselves, uh, but girls and women, obviously, throughout their lives. So it, that's, that's the how we're going to get to this. It's a long-term approach, but that's the only way we're going to get to this. Now, of course, parents have to be involved to understand this, you know, and understand the role they can play in reducing violence uh, in the family. Because there's also really good evidence that children who've been exposed to violence in the family from a young age are more likely to, uh, to inflict violence on others later on, or if they're girls, to become subject to violence, you know, to accept this as a normal way of interacting. So you mentioned about being assertive and some qualities that people also identify uh, with leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we get more women, more girls and women, uh, to be more assertive and to get involved uh, uh, seeking leadership positions? And what would happen if we had more women in leadership positions? I know we only have a minute left. but yeah. I think for girls, mentorship and support uh, so that they can believe in themselves. You know, they get so many messages that say to them they don't belong, that it's been very important to do mentorship programs with girls. And I, I, it, there is a difference. When women are in charge, when women are you know, participating equally, you see a difference in the outcomes of decision-making bodies and in change in the way people work in more team-based, collaborative approaches, which I think are the way of the future. All right, last question with a few seconds left. If you could make one change uh, in the world, as we know it, what would that be? If you could wave a magic wand and Francoise could have anything she wanted, what would it be? I would, be, I would make sure that women and girls have access to full information and services on their sexual and reproductive health. That would make such a huge difference. All right, Francoise, thank you so much. Thank you, my pleasure. Thanks for watching, I'm Aaron Harbour. We'll see you next time. Please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching.